Welcome, Initiates. Today's Akashic word is Pentecost. Now, the reason that we're addressing such a Christian topic is because we've been asked by a number of subscribers to address the mysteries of Whitson. And it's interesting because some people don't know what Whitson is. So I'm going to first give a little historical background, and then we'll get into the esoteric side of it, the initiatory side of it, which of course comes from the Akashic Records, from the work of spiritual scientists like Rudolf Steiner and others. And so we will try to elaborate on what is to be the festival coming up tomorrow, which is a major festival for the Christians, even though it's called different things in different Christian sects. For instance, it's called Trinity Sunday in the Eastern sect. It's called Whitson in the Anglican and the German Lutheran sects of Christianity. And it's called, of course, Pentecost by the Roman Catholics. And it's called the Festival of Weeks by the Hebrews, by the Jewish faith. And in fact, that's where we'll start. 50 days after the resurrection of Christ, there was the Festival of Weeks, which is a 50 day after the celebration of Passover that the Hebrews celebrate. But it also celebrates the uh, basically being freed from Egypt, the creation of the Torah, and basically remembering the great leader of the law, Moses. And so in Jerusalem, there's a most interesting place called the Cynical, C-E-N-A-C-L-E. And it is truly one of the places when I was there that I found to be the most authentic and in a way carrying the same type of spiritual vibration that you might expect from some of these places, which I did not find in Bethlehem or in the uh, church, the, uh, the Holy Sepulchre Church or Mount of Olives or these other places. But the cynical was the burial place of David. That's why in the Gospels it refers, in the Acts of the Apostles, it refers to Peter being at the place where David was buried. The tradition carries on to even today. The cynical has been rebuilt three times. Above the area where the tomb of David is, there is what is called the upper room. And that upper room was where the Essenes, the Hebrews who believed they were the only true Hebrews left because the Essenes believed had their own separate community and believed that the temple in Jerusalem was, of course, it was a terrible thing because God told them not to build a stone temple. So the apostles, 50 days after the resurrection of Christ, were gathered in the upper room in the building called the Cynical. And now this is very, very powerful because people don't understand that the cynical was the Christian synagogue, a Jewish Christian synagogue. It was sacred to the Jews, sacred to the Hebrew people, but it was also the place that the Essenes in Jerusalem met. And that's the reason that Christ would use this upper room because it was in fact a very historic, very powerful, very esoteric center for spiritual uh, wisdom in Jerusalem. So they were in the upper room. Now, the Festival of Weeks basically asks that Hebrews, Jews from all over, many different tribes, must come to one of three festivals each year in Jerusalem, and this was one of them. So when you hear later that Peter starts speaking after the descent of the Holy Spirit and the tongues of flame alighted upon their heads, Peter starts speaking to the crowd, and there's 120 people there, and you might wonder, where did they come from? And later, after he speaks, 3,000 people convert to Christianity and do what he has indicated, be baptized in the fashion that Christ was baptized, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, and also to break bread with them. Now, breaking bread is basically what we call in today's world the Holy Eucharist or Holy Communion. And when they said breaking bread, it was a remembrance of Christ giving up of his body and his blood for the sake of redemption of all people on the earth. So it is in a way in alignment with the old Jewish tradition of Passover, which was the blood of the lamb was what caused the spirit of death to pass over the Hebrew homes that were in Egypt. And it was one of the miracles of 
Moses, and it was one of the things that caused them to be able to survive the plagues of Egypt and then for Pharaoh to allow them to leave. So this is a great festival. They, But we must remember that it wasn't the first time they were gathered in the upper room. That's where they had the Holy Communion. That's where they had the Last Supper. That's where Christ gave the ritual of breaking of bread. So this is a very sacred place to them. And it says, of course, that Mary and her other Marys, or really they refer to Mary as the mother of Jesus and the other Marys, were with the apostles and they were in this room. This is the same room they were hiding in after the crucifixion. So in a way, you can imagine that the apostles did not understand what had happened. They had witnessed some of these things, at least Mother Mary and the other Marys and uh, uh, John the Divine all witnessed the crucifixion. And so we need to, in a way, paint a picture of a backdrop that would then explain what happened at Pentecost. But you cannot understand Pentecost if you do not understand another festival in the Catholic Church and the Christian Church called Ascension, which happened 40 days after the resurrection. Pentecost meaning 50, that's the meaning of the word Pentecost, 50. So 50 days after the resurrection was the descent of the Holy Spirit. As we know, Christ, before he died, promised that he would send the Holy Spirit to bring them not only comfort, but understanding. And so when you hear the word Whitson, it's actually white sun, but it also refers to wit. It refers to the wit of understanding. And Peter had not gone out and started uh, basically promulgating the ideas of Jesus Christ until that moment. Why? Because he did not have the understanding. He was not under the cross. Only St. John the Divine and Mary, Mother Mary and the other three Marys were under the cross, and they perhaps understood. They were the ones who often told the apostles, well, don't you remember what Jesus has told us? And then they would quote Jesus, and then they would say, ah, well, we still don't understand. Remember, it was Mary Magdalene who, right after the resurrection, saw the being outside of the tomb who she called the gardener, and what did he say? He said, do not touch me, for I have yet to ascend to my father, or to my throne, actually. And so from the time of the resurrection until the time of the ascension, Jesus started to appear to his apostles and to his uh, beloved disciples, especially to the women who were associated with his apostles. And on the road to Emmaus, he appears somewhere out of nowhere, talks to them until they realize that they're talking to Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, and then he disappears. And then later he appears in the upper room in the cynical, and he walks through the door. He just appears. And then he shows them the wounds, and they're able to literally touch the wounds as Thomas, the doubter, had to touch the wounds before he would believe that Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead and was now able to appear anywhere he wanted and appear in a different type of body, a body that still held the five wounds, but a body that could manifest and dissolve again. And we now know, of course, that that being of Christ is in the etheric and can manifest to many people all at once, all over the earth, who are in great states of despair and suffering. And he does so. It has been since around 1930, uh, in the 30s, it came about that many people witnessed Christ in the etheric. And then in the 60s, it happened uh, frequently that people were experiencing Jesus Christ in his risen form. So let's discuss a little bit about how this happens, because I can tell you the bottom line, but the bottom line may shock you unless you have it a perspective. We know through esoteric science, through spiritual science, that Christ, of course, and through Catholicism and the Christian faith, that Christ is one of the three members of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We must imagine, to get a full perspective of where Christ is now in his second coming, we must imagine that Christ descended from the realm of the Trinity and down through the nine hierarchical ranks 
and incarnated as a human being once and once only in history to redeem the physical nature of the earth. One could say that the earth was calcifying, the earth was growing old, it needed regeneration, it had reached a point, the, the lowest point of descent and needed to turn and start on the path of ascension. And it was only by the gift of God the Father through his son that Christ could come, take on human form, go through human life and go through death and resurrect and come back to life. Now, this was the first time that anyone had ever done such a thing. And that's the reason that it is the eternal gospel. It's telling everyone that we are like the model that Christ created, which they often call Adam Kadman, the original Adam. And this original Adam is an image of what we can become. But what we are to become is a conscious, immortal being. And many people in today's age, they don't understand that the mysteries we're supposed to reveal and understand are the mysteries of birth and death. Many people are very caught up with the mysteries of death and they're quite afraid of them and they have no path of spiritual development that can help them across the threshold between the physical and the etheric world, between the spiritual world, and get across that threshold consciously. That is the entire intent of what the Holy Spirit was to bring. So when they say Whitson, they're talking about the wit, the understanding to be able to know who the cosmic Christ truly is. Rudolf Steiner called it the Sophia of Christos or the wisdom of Christ or the wisdom of the cosmic Christ and his cosmic deed. So as Christ was descending from the Holy Trinity, he went through all nine hierarchies. There are three sets of hierarchies. And the first hierarchy is basically the domain of the Father God. The second hierarchy is the domain of Jesus Christ or Christ, the Son of God. And the third domain is the realm of the Holy Spirit. So let's walk through this a bit. This is really what is called the Via Dolorosa. It is the path of suffering, the way of suffering. And in Christ's in Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus Christ's life, as he had been condemned by Pontius Pilate, as he was flogged, as he was stripped of his clothes, as he met his mother, as he had his first fall with the cross, as he had Veronica present the cloak or the veil of Veronica, which he wiped his face off and then his face appeared in that veil of Veronica, as Simon helped him carry the cross, as he was stripped of his clothes, as he was nailed to the cross, died and went into the underworld, we could call it, the realms of hell. These are the 14 stages of the way of suffering. But what is not understood by many people is that Christ already made sacrifices before he got to the earth. So as he descended from the Trinity, he came through the different hierarchical realms, nine of them. The first realm of the seraphim are the beings of love. And he descended through that realm. Then he went into the realm of the cherubim, the beings of harmony, the spiritual beings of harmony. And then he went through the realm of the thrones, which is the beings of willpower, what we would call divine will. And those were the realm of the father. So when Christ says that his kingdom, his father's kingdom is not of this earth, it's different. He's talking about that upper three ranks of the hierarchy, the seraphim, the cherubim, and the thrones. Then he went to the realm that he is in control of, the realm that is called the spirits of wisdom, also called the spirits of the Kyriotetes, which is also called the realm of Sophia, the heavenly Sophia. And then he went to the next realm called the realm of movement, the realm of the dynamis, the realm that basically keeps our planets in movement and perfectly aligned. And then he went into the third rank of the second rank of the hierarchies. And that is the realm of the Elohim, also called Exousiae or spirits of form. And it was there that he, along with the Father God and the Holy Spirit, created the archetypal human being called Adam Kadman. Well, this Adam Kadman 
was a perfect being that never incarnated. He, this being, Adam Kadman, stayed at the throne of the Elohim because Christ then began to work from the realm of the seven Elohim. Each Elohim is in control of one of our seven major planets. And of course, Christ worked principally from the realm of the solar influence of our planetary uh, solar system. Uh, you could also point out that Elohim, one of the Elohim was called Jehovah and was the God of the moon. And this is the God that many people in their religious beliefs only attain to, is to the realm of the moon. They don't rise up through the realm of Venus, Mercury, Vulcan, to the sun, or into the outer reaches of the Father God, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So Christ was working from the realm of the Elohim when he created the archetypal being of the human. And that is what we are all following. But that being was a perfected being, never incarnated before until that being, who Rudolf Steiner calls the Nathan child, or the child who was born in the Essene community as described by the Gospel of Luke. There was another child, completely different. As a matter of fact, the birth of that child, there is hardly any two things that agree with the birth of the child in the story of Luke. The story of the birth of the child in Matthew is a quite different story. One, in Matthew, the kings come to visit in a house in Jerusalem. But in the story of, and it goes back to the kingly line of David and Solomon, but the Luke story tells about the Essene pure child that was this Adam Kadman. It was this being who had never, ever incarnated before, a perfect being who had already made three sacrifices in ancient Lemuria, two of them, and in Atlantis. We would call those Garden of Eden experiences. And so when Christ started to descend from the Elohim through the realm of the Archai, which are the beings of time, into the realm of the archangels, which are called the beings of folk souls, and through the realm of the angels, which we call the guardian angels, our guardian angels, Christ then finally became human. But when he was passing through the realm of the beings of time and the beings, he basically created the ability for human beings to stand upright. When he passed through the realm of the archangels, the folk souls, he gave people, human beings, the power of speech. And when he passed through the realm of the angels or guardian angels, he gave human beings the gift of being able to think clearly and organize their body in a way that could promote an upright, speaking, thinking human being. So these are called the pre-earthly deeds of Christ. They're talked about only in the most esoteric sections of different religions and different spiritual paths. Rudolf Steiner calls them the pre-earthly deeds of Christ. So you can see that Christ as he descended became more and more human, became closer and closer to the human being, so that when he became a human, he had already given the wonderful gifts of standing upright, speaking, and thinking. But during his time as a human being, he gave the ability for the human being to recognize through clear understanding that they are the I am, they are an ego, they are a representation personal, individualized representation of the Adam Kadman. So the Adam Kadman incarnated, as I said, through a being, I'm not going to describe that, but Dr. Uh, Tyler Gabriel has described so beautifully in volume one and two of the Gospel of Sophia. Today I'll be talking about volume three of, of that trilogy, which is called the um, Sophia Christos Initiation and giving you some examples of what that's about. But when Christ incarnated and when he died, he actually gave over to the earth his very sacred blood, where his I am went into the physical nature of the earth. The earth was decaying at that time and was in its descent and had reached its lowest point. But through the incarnation of Christ, once and only once in history, spiritual history, we have the rebirth of the earth. But through 
the Holy Spirit, that is when Sophia or the Holy Spirit came into the apostles and they had the understanding to be able to cognize what it is that they had experienced. Now, let's take this back a little bit further. Let's take it back to three years or three and a third years from the time of the baptism of John in the Jordan of Jesus of Nazareth, the mission of Christ began to manifest. Now, this mission went through many stages. And the further that Christ descended into the body of this Adam Kadman being, who we call the Nathan Jesus, the more it was that his body was beginning to be destroyed by the incredible uh, spiritual forces that Christ brought with him from the Holy Trinity, from the Elohim, and from the realms that he had descended. So all of those forces were beginning to become present in Christ. And as that happened, his body began to dissolve. As a matter of fact, the reason he had to be crucified was if he had stayed on earth much longer, his body would have dissolved and turned into a spiritual manifestation, just as it did during the transfiguration. During the transfiguration, they went up a mountain, uh, Jesus and uh, Peter, John, and James. And there, there was a manifestation of Christ's body becoming filled with light, becoming spiritual so that the spiritual nature of Christ was manifesting. And it looked as if he was rising up off the earth and turning into a luminous body. And on one side was Moses and on the other side was Elijah. Now, this also happens again with the ascension that afterwards there are two beings all in white and no one knows who they are, but there has to be someone who tells the apostles what it is that they're experiencing. So after the transfiguration, God speaks and says, behold, this is my son. And then the apostles began to understand, but they still didn't understand that Jesus of Nazareth was embodying the Christ, the son of God, one of the three members of the Holy Trinity. So the transfiguration, as we know, was some it was before the crucifixion. And then I've described the Via Dolorosa, which is the way of suffering that Christ went through and the crucifixion and the descent to hell. And then once he descended to hell, which was really not hell, it was the nine layers of the earth, just like Christ had come down through the nine layers of the hierarchy. He had to descend into the nine layers of the earth and in the core of the earth, basically ignite that part of the core of the earth that would then become as the sun. So the earth became a sun. It became a star when Christ descended through those nine realms, just as a higher spiritual being from the Trinity coming down through the nine hierarchical ranks became a human being once and once only in human history. So after the resurrection, after Christ rose from the dead, as I said, he started to appear to his apostles in many different ways. Well, they were terrified. They didn't know what to do with this. They had not understood his words, but then they generally didn't understand his words. And as he often told them, I speak to the common people in parables, but I speak to you in the language of the mysteries. And so some of the phrases that we're going to refer to today and with Christ's words are in fact mystery initiation aphorisms. They're axioms of spiritual development. And if you understand the words of Christ, then you would basically understand what it was that the apostles experienced at Pentecost. They got the wit, they got the understanding, they got the breath of God, they got the wisdom of Sophia that then empowered them to be able to witness and speak about what it was that they experienced. Before that, they were terrified to speak about it. And that's the reason that again and again, you'd find them more or less hiding in the upper room of the cynical, hiding because they were being accused of all kinds of things, of stealing the body of Jesus, of trying to fake his death, of so on and so forth. But they had the direct experience of Christ for 40 days 
coming and speaking to them, giving them this cosmic wisdom that they would need to understand what was about to happen to them. So even though some of them had experienced the incarnation of Christ, they had experienced at the baptism of John in the Jordan of Jesus of Nazareth, that God came down and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. They did not understand, even though Christ had told them that he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. He was speaking of his body. He wasn't speaking of the temple. He never destroyed the temple. When he kicked out the money changers from the temple, they didn't understand that. They didn't understand his miracles. They didn't understand most of any of it because why? It was so astoundingly unusual. It was such divine intervention that they couldn't comprehend it. They had to have the Holy Spirit before they could comprehend it. Now, when you talk about the Holy Spirit, that's when the Christians, their different sects, go different ways. Some will tell you that the Holy Spirit is the being of wisdom, the being of Sophia. Some will tell you that they don't understand who the Holy Spirit is. That's why they call it the Holy Ghost. They thought it was the ghost of Jesus. The ghost of Jesus, mind you, instead of the divine holy breath of God that was bringing them the cosmic understanding of Christ or the cosmic Christ, what Rudolf Steiner calls the, the Sophia of Christ, the wisdom of Christ. As a matter of fact, Rudolf Steiner indicates that that's what we need in our time. We don't need the full understanding of the mysteries that Christ brought. We need the wisdom, the Sophia, the Kyriotetes, the wisdom of the mothers, the three mothers, as Rudolf Steiner calls it. Uh, and that is what we need to understand the deeds of Christ. So if you were one of the three apostles who witnessed the transfiguration, that you knew about the crucifixion, that you witnessed the resurrection, that you witnessed for 40 days Christ coming back and teaching the apostles continuously, then you would possibly be prepared to imagine what the souls of the apostles were going through when they were hiding in the room during the festival of the weeks, a festival of weeks, 50 days after the resurrection and 10 days after the ascension. Now let's talk about the ascension. After 40 days, they went up a mountain and some of the apostles were there and they witnessed Christ being raised up in what they said, into the clouds. Well, when they refer to into the clouds, that's the etheric body. That's the life body. That is the body of life that Christ came to renew. But he had renewed the earth and basically changed its course so that it was no longer descending, but now was ascending. But now Christ needed to, as he said, to Mary Magdalene at the tomb, um, do not touch me for I am ascending to my throne. Well, where is the throne of Christ right now? The throne of Christ has first off descended through all those ranks from the Trinity, all through the nine ranks down to the earth. And he was on the earth only for three and a half years or three and a third years, according to some. And during that time, he did his teaching. It was not written down. It was literally word of mouth passed on to the apostles, which I'll also speak about that in a minute when I speak about the language of the spirit. But what was it that was really happening during the ascension? Christ's body had been so purified and turned back into its spiritual nature that it left the realm of the human and went into the realm of the angels. And that realm can be considered the realm of essentially what we call the etheric realm of the earth. It's also called by the Tibetans and others in the East, the realm of Shambhala or Tushita heaven, or as Christ calls it, his father's house, which has many mansions. In this case, Christ is rising up into the mansion from the physical into the etheric. And right now we know because people have experienced this, tens of thousands of people have experienced witnessing Christ through their guardian angel, and they witnessed through their guardian angel an image of Christ alive and renewing the etheric realm of the earth. 
In other words, the earth that was dying is now coming to bloom. It is truly the resurrection of the etheric body of the earth. And as you know, humans in today's age are doing everything they can to destroy the etheric realm and to destroy the life body of the human being, the etheric body of the human being. And so Christ is in that realm now. As a matter of fact, when he ascended, two beings in white, and they, there's often these two beings in white who show up, as I say, to explain what just happened. And they explained, why are you looking up into heaven? Do you not know that Christ's return will be in the same fashion, that he will return upon a cloud, and that he basically appear in the etheric, return upon a cloud. The cloud is a reference to the etheric. And so Christ is there now. So people who are hoping for the second coming, they needn't hope. They need to directly experience it. Ask your guardian angel to show you where Christ is now. And through your angel, through the being of the physical nature of Jesus of Nazareth that was called the Adam Kadman, or Rudolf Steiner calls the Nathan soul, through the Nathan soul, who is active in the realm of the angels and was part of the pre-earthly deeds of Christ, he was there for all three of them, we can use that being, that perfect archetype, Adam Kadman, to contact the what is called the phantom body, in other words, the resurrection body or the body of fulfillment of Christ's mission, and each of us has a phantom body, we need to replicate exactly what Christ went through. We have descended through the hierarchy. We have gone through, many of us, through initiation, the way of suffering, the Via Dolorosus. We've gone through our own crucifixions. We've descended into hell, many of us who have been initiated. And now we are, at, and we have been transfigured uh, at certain points during that initiation. And now it is the process of ascension. We are to follow in the perfect model, the perfect paradigm, the, the perfect schemata of what our spiritual path looks like as we follow the example of Christ. So now it's our time to ascend. Well, how is it that we ascend? The first thing we need to know is that we'll be leaving the physical body and ascending through the etheric body, through the life body, into the realm of the it's also called the realm of spiritual economy, but it's also called the realm of Shambhala or this heavenly realm, which isn't all, which isn't heaven itself, but it's a heavenly realm, an etheric realm where everything is full of life and the angels and archangels work together there to restore the human body every night when you sleep. That's what is going on. The hierarchy is restoring your body through your etheric body, your physical body, dies throughout the day and needs to be restored at night. Well, that happens every night. It happens when you die, but it's supposed to happen also during initiation. So Christ was showing everyone what their path would look like. As a matter of fact, he says, I have gone before you. And when he makes that reference, he's talking about the fact that he is now ascending. And he's not just going to ascend from the realms of hell, the nine realms of hell, he's going to ascend into the etheric body. And then later in history, he will be ascending through the realm of the astral body, the realm of desires, the realm where conscience arises, the realm where love should rule. And then he will ascend further, teaching us exactly what that path is into the realm of the I am. But when we get to that realm, it's only through human sacrifice that we give up our own personal individualized I am and start to take up on the I am of Christ. In other words, not I, but Christ in me. And then he will continue to ascend through other realms that are described in spiritual science that I'm not going to get into at this point, but let's just say that Christ has redeemed the physical. He's now redeeming the etheric. In the future, he will redeem the astral and take us with him, by the way. And then he'll go into the realm of the I am and the Christed I am, your higher spiritual, three spiritual natures. So this is what the apostles witnessed, but they did not understand it. 
they actually were witnessing the fact that the second coming of Christ is available for anyone who has the gift of the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, wit, Whitson, uh, White Sunday, they call it in, in many, in the Anglican church, they'd all dress up in white and they took the religious practices of the Celts called Beltane, uh, a, what would be called pagan rituals, mixed it with Christian rituals and they would bring more white into the vestments for their religious services, as well as everyone would dress in white and celebrate and have uh, a festival time. Why? That's because this is the time when human beings can cognize, when they can understand the redemption of the human being through the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Christ, if you want to say where and when is the second coming of Christ, it's already happened. And what did he say? And what do the other gospel um, say, as well as the Bible makes reference to this in a variety of places, including the book of Revelation? In the book of Revelation, it says that Christ will come upon a cloud, will be seen from east to west, will take his sickle, and will harvest his faithful. That has already happened for anyone who is an initiate, who has gone the way of Christ, the path of Christ which includes, of course, the suffering, the Via Dolorosis, the path of suffering, and the path of resurrection, the path of transfiguration, the path of ascension. But there's still one more stage. We all know that the Bible tells us that there are two types of baptism, one by water and one by spirit. And the one by spirit is by fire. So after Christ ascended, he did not leave them. He told them, I will never leave you. I will be here until the end of the earth. And he meant that quite literally. He is now in the etheric realm, but his physical nature is still impregnated, still inside of the earth. And he's turned the earth into a star. He's turned the earth into a celestial body. A, and we know this a bit in, through science, that the sun is basically going to extinguish itself in the end, and the earth will unite with the sun, according to esoteric science, and the earth and the sun will unite and become a different type of sun in the future, not the sun that we see today. But the sun has gone through uh, three previous manifestations that we see left as evidence as Saturn, as Jupiter, and as Mars, or what Rudolf Steiner calls ancient Saturn ancient sun, ancient moon, until we got to the realm of the earth. So there were three previous incarnations of the earth, and in the future there will be three more, Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan. And as we go through those, those are higher realms of the gifts of the hierarchy that we are the manifestation of. And when we go to those higher realms, we will now be giving back gifts to those hierarchical beings who gave us the gifts of what we would call our physical, etheric, astral, and ego. And during the earth incarnation, it was the Elohim, the beings of form led by Christ on the sun that gave us the formation of our nine con uh, constitutions of our body. There are nine elements to our physical, soul, and spirit nature. And basically we are a perfect replica of the hierarchical manifestation, and we are a replica of the Holy Trinity. But those are the mysteries that come with the Holy Spirit. So when we speak about Whitson or we speak about Pentecost or Trinity Sunday, we are unable to address it unless we understand that Christ ascended, but he did not leave this plane. He did not go back to the realm of the Father. He did not go back to the Holy Trinity. He is still with us, and he will be with us through every step of the way. Now, the early church was certainly confused, and the apostles had the ability to speak of what they witnessed. And what they witnessed were these miraculous mysteries and manifestations that I've been describing. And so they had that benefit. In today's world, it's only through faith and your direct experience with these beings and so this isn't really a matter of belief or dogma or doctrine. It is a matter of what you have experienced. 
The reason there's almost no historical record of Christ, Jesus Christ, or Jesus of Nazareth, except one entry, a very small entry saying that they had killed another zealot who was named Jesus from the village of Nazareth, which was an Essene village. That's about the only reference we have. The rest is all word of mouth where people are saying what they experienced. So in today's world, many Christians do not have an experience of Christ. They do not have a direct relationship with Christ in the etheric. But any spiritual path that I've ever studied in my comparative religion studies, whether it be Tibetan Buddhism, Hinduism, it doesn't really matter. They're going to speak about a being who has come to regenerate the earth. And in ancient Hindu philosophy, it would be the being of Vishnu. In um, other, Hindu, uh, uh, other uh, Hindu and Eastern philosophies, it's called Vishvakarman. This being is called in ancient Persian, it's called uh, the being of Christ as his descent, as he's descending in the solar rays from the sun was called Ahura Mazdeo. So there are many names describing Christ in the past, but what we must do in our age is have a direct experience of Christ in the etheric realm. Now, we can't experience that fully because Christ is actually manifesting now through the realm of the archangels and it would take a highly inspired person who was already christened themselves, had already attained the realm of Christ consciousness with their own I am to directly experience Christ. But what we can experience through our guardian angel is the living forces of Christ in the etheric that can be witnessed by those with the eyes to see and ears to hear. Because you also do hear. You hear it as a effulgent waves of light in the realm of the angels, and you hear it as the rushing of wind in the archangelic realm, and then you hear what I'm about to describe as the language of the spirit. We might call that language of the spirit the spheres, the, the harmony of the spheres. In other words, the work of Christ through the Elohim, through the seven, the six planets and our sun, they create a symphony. And that symphony always accompanies Christ at this point in the etheric. So you have to have eyes to see and ears to hear. And then in the future, we'll have the will to be able to tame our astral body, tame our desires, tame the dragon of our desires, and turn it into the surrendering unto the will of the Father God through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and through the love of Christ. And that then will create our own christening, where the chrism oil is placed upon us and we are anointed and our Christ, the I am, or Christ in me, will come to birth. So let's talk about what happened then on Pentecost. As I tried to describe earlier, they were terrified. They really didn't know what to do. They had lost their teacher. You might say that they were rather spoiled because for three and a half years, they had the divine being from the Holy Trinity amongst them, teaching them, loving them. And in some cases, as Rudolf Steiner points out, some of them at different times were able to experience that so profoundly that it entered into them and they would start to speak as Christ spoke through Jesus of Nazareth. And this was a very profound thing. So they had these experiences, but they really didn't know what to do with them. And because they weren't like the women who listened to every word Christ said and constantly repeated it to the apostles. They were, as I say, very scared. They didn't know what they were supposed to do with what they had experienced and what they had been taught. Because Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, did not write down his teachings. And there's some debate that there were documents even that the uh, our Father, the prayer that Christ gave in the uh, to the apostles that appears in the Gospels, was taken from the Q document or from the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, later, uh, there was a version called the Letter of Barnabas, and from those documents, there was a short document called the Two Paths or the Two Ways, the Way of Light and the Way of Darkness, and that can be found in a document which is called the 
original teachings of the apostles about Jesus Christ. It's called the Daideci, Daideci, uh, that just means teachings. So these teachings were there. They had passed them on from one person to the next, from mouth to ear in an oral tradition, but they still didn't know what to do with it. They didn't understand that they were supposed to transform the world, even though Christ had already given them their instructions to go out and to heal the sick, to cast out demons, and to preach the eternal gospel, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they had practiced that, and they came back sometimes woefully disappointed that they weren't able to do all that Christ was able to do when they were in his presence. But now he was no longer with them. He had ascended into the etheric realm, into the clouds. Could they see him in the clouds? Not that we know of. But they do remember that Christ said, I will send you the comforter. I will send you understanding. Now, did they know on that day when they were celebrating the festival of weeks, when they were in the upper room, did they know that the Holy Spirit was going to come then? I don't think so. There didn't seem to be any indication of that in the Gospels or in the Acts of the Apostles as they wrote them out. So they were somewhat surprised that as they were there, again, locked in the room, scared, afraid, afraid that at any moment that the Romans and the Sadducees and the Pharisees could come and do to them what they had done to Christ, to Jesus of Nazareth, they feared that. But it was the comfort of Mother Mary or the mother of Jesus and the Marys who basically comforted them in this and said that they needed to continue to celebrate and that they needed to break bread together. So there they were in the upper room, once again, breaking bread, remembering that Jesus Christ had offered his body and his blood as a sacrifice for the redemption of all humanity and particularly through the apostles and the disciples. So, at that moment, they experienced the rushing of wind, a very powerful. This is often the case when you experience um, a spiritual manifestation. You will hear it as wind blowing. And then upon their heads alighted tongues of flame. Now, these tongues of flame, what were they? Did they understand at that moment that that was the Holy Spirit or what the original church called the Holy Ghost? In other words, the ghost of Jesus. They weren't having a seance. They weren't trying to have Jesus come back and manifest to them because they had seen him ascend. What they were doing was attempting to create the understanding in themselves so that they could be the witness to the world. And they could, through this, ask people to receive the baptism of water. And ultimately, through breaking of the bread, the baptism of fire. So they were going through the baptism of fire at that time. And the tongues of flame, of course, represent the Holy Spirit. We often see the picture of the Holy Spirit descending as a dove. That's why I'm wearing a little white kind of dove here, so that it would represent this descent of the Holy Spirit. Now, theologians will debate this all day long. Was the Holy Spirit there before Christ left? Was did it take Christ leaving and ascending for the Holy Spirit to arise? Well, the answer to that is quite simple. The Holy Trinity is one in three. All three are one, and each one is part of the three. So there's no such thing as the Father God without Christ and Christ without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit didn't just get created at that moment. The Holy Spirit was there at creation, just like Jesus excuse me, just as Christ, as the Son of God, was there at creation. And so there is no arising or birth of the Holy Spirit. The birth was in the apostles, that they had matured enough through their trepidation, their trials, their tribulations, through what they had witnessed, through the blessings of Christ, his miracles, his healings, through the transfiguration, through the resurrection, through the ascension. They had experienced all of these things but they couldn't put it into words. They couldn't actually witness for Christ because they were too frightened. So it gave them courage. And what is this Holy Spirit? Well, that's highly debatable. Some will say the Holy Spirit is the feminine aspect of the divine in a being. 
some will say, many different descriptions of this being. But what they don't quite explain is how it is that the Holy Spirit had this power at this moment. It was because the apostles had evolved enough to receive the spirit of understanding, that they were scared enough that they could receive the spirit of comfort, the comforter. They were bold enough and courageous enough after this baptism of fire that they immediately went out and started to speak to 120 people that were gathered around the cynical. And later, 3,000 people were baptized after this witnessing of Peter and the apostles to the people who had gathered for the festival of weeks there in Jerusalem. Now, one way to understand this is to get Dr. Tyler Gabriel's book, The Gospel of Sophia. Now, this is the volume three called The Initiation of um, Christos, the Sophia Christos Initiation, volume three, The Gospel of Sophia. These can be found on Amazon, but they can also be found on our sites for free in a PDF form. These are some of the most profound initiatory words that anyone has put in one book. Now, the Gospel of Sophia, Volume 1, explains the nature of the Divine Feminine Trinity. Gospel of Sophia 2, that volume describes the preparation that you need for the initiation, basically, of Pentecost, the initiation of the Holy Spirit. But in the Gospel of Sophia, that would be called the initiation of the Holy Sophia, or what Rudolf Steiner calls the being of Anthroposophia. Now, this being had been around for a long time and had been there during the development of humankind in its spiritual evolution, but it couldn't manifest openly until the full understanding of the redemption of Christ and the mysteries of Christ, the mystery of Golgotha, of the resurrection, of the transfiguration, of ascension, once these were understood, and that understanding could only come from the divine, it could only come from the Holy Trinity. So when they had this, then they received what is called the language of the Spirit. Our language on earth, of course, was confused, and that's the reason we have the metaphor or the story of the Tower of Babel. When the pride of human beings became so pronounced that they thought they could build a structure into the heavens and storm heaven as human beings to try to claim the power of the divine. Of course, we all know how that worked out. So in ancient times, there was a universal language and it was accompanied by natural clairvoyance. That faded over time until around 2000 BC, Abraham and his people began to have clear cognitive thinking, but it took the mystery of Golgotha before human beings could actually have a true independent I am that could understand these things. And it took what the apostles went through, their initiation as it were, before they could actually do anything about it. So when Peter started speaking to the crowd, there were people there from all over, many kingdoms, many tribes, and they all understood what he was saying. And what was he saying? He was speaking about the nature of Christ and the fact that Christ came to teach us that we are all immortal beings, that we do not die with death, that we go beyond that, and that Christ is an emissary who came to redeem the earth and now is redeeming the life body of the earth. And so this is what we would call the Sophia of Christos, the Sophia of Christ, the wisdom of Christ. That's what they preached. And the language they were speaking was directly from their heart, from what they had experienced. It was no theoretical doctrine or dogma. It was, and they weren't even necessarily using the words of Christ. They were saying, this is what we experienced. And because they were these witnesses, uh, the people were able to understand it. They were able to accept it. And they accepted baptism. 3,000 of them accepted baptism and then came to break bread with them. In other words, conduct the Holy Eucharist, or do this in remembrance of me, knowing that the body and blood of Christ were the sacrifice that have redeemed humans from their sin. So this language of the Spirit, what is it? Well, in there's an article that we are providing in below this podcast where we extract things from Dr. Gabriel's book. 
the Gospel Sophia, volume three. And in the back of the book or in the middle and then again in the appendix, we, because I got to help on this book, pulled together 22 sayings because 22 is the number of letters in the original phonetic alphabet, what's called Proto-Hebraic and many others. Everywhere all over the world, basically you have 22 consonants and seven vowels. Well, the vowels represent the planets and their movement, and, that, and they um, are not even used in Hebrew. The vowels are hidden because they're so sacred. But the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet represent the 12 zodiacal signs with two letters per each, so 24. But the 22 is because those are the paths found in the Tree of Life, the Tree of Sephiroth. They're the 22 major arcana of the Tarot that the Egyptians used in the Isis, uh, the Emerald Tablet of Bimbus, or the Tablets of Isis. So these things have been around for a long time. They're well known. They're etheric formative forces coming in from the stars and from the planets, and they are what constitute our body. As a matter of fact, Rudolf Steiner pointed out that if you could take all the alphabet and say it all at once in one expression, you would have the human being standing before you. So these are not theoretical constructs. These are physical forces. These are, in fact, beings who work through the etheric formative forces that are raying into our body at all times. So this language of the spirit can be found in every religion, in every serious teaching, any true esoteric spiritual teaching will have these alphabet, have this alphabet, 22. So we went to the Bible and we looked at the sayings of Jesus Christ. And some of them we know well, we'd call them aphorisms or sayings, not the Proverbs. No, these are sayings, truth sayings. And when you say each of these, and you, if you were to say all of them, which are found in this Gospel of Sophia, Volume 3, if you were to say each one of the 27, 22, you would in fact have the ability to ascend. You would in fact have the ability to contact your guardian angel through morality and enter into the perception, the imaginal perception of Christ in the etheric realm in other words, attain the second coming. Now, when you know the vowels, that is a different thing. That is to understand time. To understand the consonants is to understand space. To understand the vowels is to understand time. And so we put also in this book things like Johannes Tauler, who a great master came to him when he was giving lectures and his sermons, and they were so powerful that people said he was the greatest speaker of his time. But a great master came to him and said, no, you need to go into silence and not speak for quite a long time. And then when you come out, you'll have the power of the spirit. So he did. And when he came out, he wrote down an alphabet using literally the alphabet, ABCs. And with each of them, each alphabetic letter was to be a mnemonic device to help you remember these phrases. So if you say these 22 phrases, they are morality teachings. They are a book of wisdom. They are the temple of wisdom. They are the pillars of wisdom. They are the redemption, or basically they're the seven virtues. And that's what the, the vowels represent, or the seven virtues, or the seven uh, pillars in the temple of wisdom. But you also need then the dome, and you need the structure of that temple, and that is created by the consonants. So Johannes Tauler then gave out this morality alphabet, which is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So we've, we've included that in the article below this podcast, as well as the 22 sayings of Christ. I think we call it Christ's words and the original teachings of the apostles with the subtitle, A Language of the Spirit, because this is the example for Christians of the language of spirit, the language that the Holy Spirit brought during Pentecost, the wisdom teachings, the book of wisdom that they then worked out of and then promulgated Christianity all over the world, all by word of mouth. Remember, the original apostles didn't write anything down. There were some extant works of uh, previous uh, books of wisdom, but that's not the essence of Christianity. 
The essence of Christianity is the love that flows from one person to the next and carries with it the spirit of Christ and the spirit of the Holy Spirit. We also include what is called the original catechism of the apostles, which I had mentioned before is called the Daideci or the teachings of the apostles. And in there, you could basically say that the doctrine and the dogma of the Christian, the early Christian faith promulgated by the apostles can be found in this beautiful, beautiful document. Most people don't know it exists, but if you want a shortened version and you want the language of the spirit and you want to learn to speak the language of the angels, it is through morality. It is through what we call imagination, inspiration, and intuition. And essentially the words of Christ are the moral imagination that you need to enter the realm of the angels. The alphabet of Johannes Tauler will help you enter into the words that are sacred, that uh, solicit the moral development that is necessary to enter into the realm of the archangels. And when you read this, uh, basically the catechism of the apostles, the doctrine and dogma of the apostles, you will be told what to do. In other words, you enter the realm of the archai, the beings of time through your willpower, which then creates intuition. So imagination, inspiration, and intuition are more or less given as a path through what you can find in the Gospel of Sophia, but particularly through these three things that we have extracted from the Gospel of Sophia and placed in the article below. So when it comes to Pentecost, the Pentecost is now, if you've had the baptism of water, if you have followed the path of Christ, the cosmic Christ through his descent and uh, ascension, and particularly through those festival days of Christmas, of Easter, of resurrection, of transfiguration, of ascension, and then sending the comforter, the Holy Spirit, then you can attain the baptism of fire. And when you do, you will have these characteristics arise in you. You will first off understand your relationship to your moral actions during your life. And if you haven't had moral actions, then you're not going to have much to relate to it. It'll also show your strivings that you've had towards this wisdom that you've attempted on your own. It'll also be an indication of whatever inspiration has come from reading the Bible, from reading the words of Christ, from reading the alphabet, the moral alphabet of Johannes Tauler or the Catechism of the Apostles. All of those things will become manifest to you just before you have your initiation of the baptism of fire. And when that happens, you will have courage, fantastic courage to be able to do what it is that you have now experienced personally. You will have moral impulses that you will want to rectify any immorality that you see in the world. And you will be filled with so much love that the fire of Christ, the fire of the Holy Spirit will fill your heart. And that's the true mysteries of the Pentecost. Those are the mysteries of White Sunday or the Trinity Sunday or the mysteries of what the Hebrews called the Festival of Weeks. In other words, they're great teachings, they're great wisdom experience, and to directly connect with Moses and Elijah uh, through their tradition. But for us, this anointing of the Spirit, this Pentecost, these tongues of flame, this baptism of fire, awakens you to the wisdom of Christ as a cosmic being, and also to the love of Christ and what it is that he has given us as his teachings. So that's why we have brought this as the Akashic word of the day, Pentecost. And we wanted to reveal some of the mysteries of Ascension and Pentecost because they go together as a gift, the newest gift of Christ to us in our time and in our hearts. So Pentecost, tomorrow, as you celebrate it, remember we are beings of fire, but that fire now needs to burn the wisdom fire of Christ, the wisdom fire of the Holy Spirit. And at that point, you will be comforted. 
you will understand that Christ is real, that his second coming has already happened, and you will be given the spirit of understanding.